we'll get going. Uh, so today I'm going to be here to present about the Eclipse OMR project and the, uh, the different capabilities and uh, the technology that we provide there. Uh, my name is Charlie Gracie. I'm a senior software developer at IBM and I've been working on the IBM J9 Java virtual machine for over 10 years. It's probably closer to 13 now. Um, I'm the garbage collection architect for the JVM technology and I'm also uh, one of the co-project leads for the Eclipse OMR project. Uh, and my Twitter handle's on there. That's probably the easiest way to get in contact with me if anybody wants to see what I'm up to or, get, or ask any questions. Um, so before I really get going, I mentioned I work for IBM, so here's my safe harbor slide telling you guys you can't believe anything I say. Don't buy any stocks based on what I say. All right, so one of the first questions I get asked everywhere when the question part comes up is what does OMR stand for? Uh, so I'll cover that first today. Uh, technically, it stands for nothing. Um, it's not an acronym. Uh, originally, uh, we were calling the project internally the Open Managed Runtime. So the acronym OMR actually got used quite a bit in our code base and just in the way we were talking about it. But at one point, we realized that we're not actually building a managed runtime. We're building a toolkit for building them. So we decided that, that what the name wasn't appropriate, but everyone was used to the acronym. So we sort of just stuck with it as we went forward with the project. Another question I get all the time, because this is at the Eclipse OMR project, is what does this have to do with the Eclipse IDE? And what does it, and uh, how does it improve the IDE or your experience there? Uh, again, uh, it doesn't actually have anything to do with the Eclipse IDE. Uh, the project is just part of the Eclipse Foundation, uh, which is where we host our project. Uh, so that's why it has the name Eclipse in it, but it's not actually related to the IDE at all. Okay, so for this talk today, I'm going to cover the Eclipse OMR project itself, sort of our rationale for creating the project, what its purpose is, uh, cover the different parts, the technology parts of the project at this point, uh, and then talk about some of the different projects in the wild that are, we've been prototype using it or that are using the OMR project, uh, what's next, our kind of sort of next steps for the project, and how you can get involved. Uh, so the Eclipse project itself was created in March 2016. Um, here I have a bunch of the links. You can go to our uh, main website at Eclipse, visit our uh, GitHub account, or you can actually go to um, IBM provides developer.ibm.com where there's a lot of all the open source projects IBM work on. They have blogs and different technical articles available there. So you can go there and find out more information about our project. Uh, the project is dual licensed as Apache and a version one and, a, and the version two, sorry, and the EPL. Um, and contributors are always welcome. And we're looking for more contributors. Um, just a quick uh, view of one of our stats pages. Uh, you can see we started the project in March, and for a few months we were slowly getting a bunch of commits through, but in the last, I would say, six, eight months, we've really ramped up, and we're probably having on the order of like 20 to 30 commits per day. So before I really talk about the OMR project, I want to cover sort of what are the different parts of a language runtime. So the different parts of the language runtime for Java is you will have, you always start with your source for Java. You will run it through a bytecode compiler, so it'll take your Java source, turn it down into bytecodes that can be executed. And then you'll have the actual interpreter that will interpret those bytecodes to perform all the actions required. For the interpreter to be able to work, you actually have to be able to allocate memory for the objects, um, reclaim objects once they've been collected because it's actually a managed heap in Java. So we have a garbage collector as one of the other major components. Um, Java will runs on pretty much every platform you can think of, and OS and architecture variants. 
So there's usually some sort of platform abstraction layer that you have so that you don't have to worry about all these different platform and OS uh, differences as you're moving from one platform to the other as you're actually writing the VM. So it's a very useful way to abstract out the different uh, characteristics of those OSs to sort of give a consistent picture to the VM developers themselves. As with most uh, runtimes, uh, to get really peak performance, the Java VM has a just-in-time compiler. So this will actually take your uh, bytecodes and run them through a bunch of different optimization passes and generate machine-specific code for the machine you're running on to actually give you more performance. Uh, and one of the other major components that I'll be talking about today is uh, sort of diagnostic and monitoring services. One of the big things that a lot of these mature runtimes bring to the table are a set of these tools that help you actually debug and performance analyze your running application themselves. And then if you actually have any problems, like say your virtual machine crashing, um, which never happens because us VM developers are amazing, uh, but really uh, there's lots of uh, bugs in software. So we need this ability to actually be able to help us debug any problems that you may run into in your application. So if I pull up a picture again, it looks very similar, but I talk about uh, a Ruby uh, VM. You'll start to notice that there's a lot of the same components in here. Uh, they have the they have the interpreter, they have a garbage collector, they have some platform services to be able to run on different platforms, and again, they have some diagnostic services. In this case, though, Ruby doesn't actually, uh, the MRI VM that I'm talking about, doesn't actually have a just-in-time compiler, but the rest of the components are all there. So now I'll take another quick look at a JavaScript VM, and you'll notice again quickly, all of the same components. So with all of these different VMs, they all have very similar components, but all of the components have different implementations. So as you put effort into improving, say, uh, adding a new just-in-time compilation uh, optimization for Java, that actually provides you no uplift in any of these other runtimes uh, that are their own standard VMs. So, Lots of new hardware features come out regularly. So like everybody's talking about offloading things to GPU now using RDMA. As you continue to add these into one, it's actually a huge cost to get them into all of the virtual machines that you may actually want to run in your environment. And where you really start to see this matter is in the cloud. So a lot of people are moving all of their workloads into the cloud but you may end up using some of your old larger legacy apps on Java, but you might want to run a bunch more of your newer things on Node or Ruby, but you don't have a very consistent view of what's going on on those runtimes. So cloud is really built on runtimes. With these clouds, they try and make this guarantee, one of the main things they try and guarantee or provide in the cloud is a very resilient, secure, efficient, elastic and, con and consistent view. But all of these different runtimes actually provide a whole lot of different features. They have different debugging tools. They have different levels of support for the actual architectures and features available on the system. Uh, so you can only actually build the cloud environment based on top of these runtimes. So in a lot of cases, you're sort of held down to sort of the lowest bar if you want to uh, run different things on the different VMs. or in cases where your uh, cloud environment started providing new uh, CPU features or those things, it may take a very long time for you to be able to recognize some of those new features in the other runtimes, especially depending on which communities they're coming from. So the Eclipse OMR mission is to build a reusable language runtime foundation for these cloud platforms or just in general for different runtimes. Uh, we really want to accelerate the advancement and, and the innovation in a lot of these runtimes. Uh, one of the big things, though, is we don't want to actually change or fracture any of the current runtime communities that exist. So if you actually have 
a runtime already, we want to be able to actually say that you could just maybe not improve it, but add to it or get new features by consuming different pieces of OMR. Uh, and we want to engage with all of the different communities. We want to be involved with research, academia, um, other professional developers, and all kinds of areas, and just hobbyists as well. So the main key goals for OMR is that as we start this project, the actual toolkit itself has no language semantics. The, number, the second biggest thing we want to do is we want to say that the OMR is there for building runtimes, but it's not actually a runtime itself. So that's why we didn't call it the Open Manage Runtime in the end, is it's not actually a runtime, it's just different components you could use to actually build a runtime. And we want to keep these components sort of separated so that they could be consumed as sort of an as-needed basis. You may just want to get a parallel GC instead of having a single threaded GC. You may want to add a just-in-time compiler. You may just want to have some different, to plot to different port to different platforms, so you just may want to pick up and use the porting and thread library. And by picking up and using OMR, we don't want to actually change any of any way how your um, runtime works, and we don't want to influence in any way by causing you to change or run on and provide any sem language semantics ourselves. So the first two points here, I think, really sort of differentiate the OMR project from uh, the other two sort of similar high-level approaches. And those approaches are running your language actually on top of the JVM itself or the core CLR. Both of those are really language runtimes themselves, so they do force you to uh, follow their semantics for their memory model and those types of things. So you do have to be aware and you can, or you're sort of limited to what they provide. So by having the first two of these options, or sorry, goals for the OMR project, it really gives us and enables the third where we don't enforce anything on your runtime. So a picture you've sort of seen before. So how did we actually create the OMR project? Well, we actually started with the J9 Java Virtual Machine. Uh, it was a, uh, the VM that we had all worked on. Uh, and as we were looking at the virtual machine, we realized that a lot of these components were very common, as I talked about before, with all the other runtimes. But they also actually have langu language agnostic components to them. So as an example, the garbage collector, for doing a lot of the work in the GC, you don't actually have to know very much about the language. Maybe you need to know about their root set, uh, a few other things that you need to know, but a lot of the actual data structures, the algorithms for marking, uh, finding the garbage, collecting the memory, that's all very language agnostic and doesn't really matter about your language. So as we looked through a lot of our components, we realized that they all had a lot of these features. So we decided we could pull them out and make them into uh, this language agnostic uh, set of frameworks for, sorry, components for building a runtime. Uh, some of the components, though, actually do require a bit of knowledge. Uh, so you'll see the GC, the just-in-time compiler, and the diagnostic services have this sort of glue layer beside them. That's sort of the communication and the sort of required API you have to provide to be able to consume that, that component. So it's really gluing OMR to your, uh, to your language runtime. Um, and these would be as simple as in the just-in-time compiler, sort of your, defining your optimization strategy or adding any of your own language-specific optimizations. Or in the GC, telling the GC how do the shape of your objects look like in your root set. So from there, we sort of just pulled those out, those pieces, and this was our initial set of OMR components that we were working on making available. So in the project to date, we have our port, our thread library, um, some VM APIs that are just sort of used to communicate between the different components. These basically provide per interpreter and per thread context where information can be shared uh, between the components. Uh, the garbage collection framework, 
uh, compiler, uh, which is our ex extensible frame compiler framework. JIT Builder, which is a library that I'll cover a little bit, a uh, bit in, and more in the future and later in the talk, which actually is there to uh, simplify bringing up a just-in-time compiler for a runtime. Uh, our trace library, and we started to build a very sophisticated FV test library as well. Uh, this is sort of the first time we've actually been able to test the different components of a runtime at a really uh, heavy level because they're actually separate now and you don't have to test the whole system. So it's actually improved a lot of our code as we've been going forward. Uh, at this point in the project, we're somewhere close to eight or 900,000 lines of code. And all these components have actually been coming from the Java, the J9 Java VM. So I'll talk quickly about some of the sort of bigger components to cover what they do. Um, give you a bit of detail so that you kind of are aware what you could take a, do with them. Um, so as I mentioned uh, a bit before, the port and thread technology is really there to provide a sort of common API down to the OS platform C library calls that you may need to make in the other components. Uh, these APIs aren't consistent across all the platforms that are supported, because uh, right now the OMR project supports uh, for architectures X, uh, x86, P, uh, ZOS, and ARM, or Z, uh, the 390 architecture and ARM, V7. Uh, so and then when you start having the OSs like Linux and Windows and AIX and ZOS, there's a lot of different APIs on calls. So you don't really want the different parts of the GC or the JIT to actually have to be full of this if def soup everywhere to be able to go make these calls. So we have one call that you could make to go say create a thread and depending on your platform, it'll go do the right thing. So that way, when you wanted to move to a new platform, you really are only porting the port library and the thread library. Uh, so that makes it a lot easier to move from one new system to another. Uh, the garbage collection technology. Uh, so we have a very highly parallel and scalable garbage collector that's been used in our uh, Java VM for a couple of decades at this point. Uh, it's continually being uh, modified and improved to do different things like for a long time we worked on scaling out uh, so the GC can scale up to hundreds of cores, divide the work. It has a very sophisticated work sharing setup. Um, it's very good at, for its automatic management. But the great part is, if you wanted to consume some of the more basic features to start out, you can actually bring up the GC by probably writing less than 100 lines of code in a new interpreter. Um, and it's probably a day or two's worth of work. Um, but then if you needed more features or you wanted to see more improve, uh, performance improvements and things, you could actually start it using more of the advanced capabilities like adding a compactor, the generational collector, uh, concurrent marking to improve your global collection times, or take advantage of our, some of our more uh, new technology, which is region-based. Um, and if anyone's familiar with uh, OpenJDK, uh, be more similar to the G1 technology there. Uh, because I want to give a quick explanation of how you would bring up the simple mark sweep GC in a new runtime, I will just cover very quickly what a mark sweep GC is. Uh, so in uh, any runtime doing a mark sweep GC, you would be using the, uh, the memory ma management stuff to allocate your uh, objects and then periodically throughout the execution of the VM, uh, you would stop all of the application threads, um, mark all of the live objects. You would find these via the root set, which are things like thread stacks, any globals that the VM has to remember. And you would mark all of those as live and then sort of recursively visit every object they reference, uh, keeping all of those objects live. Uh, once you've found all of the live objects, you can assume everything else is not alive, and you collect that memory and make it available for the application to use again. So to actually bring up and use the OMRGC in a new runtime, 
there's actually only four or five steps you have to do. Um, one and five are really just the startup and shutdown APIs for the OMR library itself. Uh, so these just really bring up any of the different components that you have. Uh, so based on what build flags you use uh, when you were configuring OMR, the startup and shutdown would actually start up those different components and shut them down. Uh, you'd have to provide an implementation for any required glue. Um, and again, based on build flags, if you're doing the very simple GC, you don't have to provide any of the sophisticated glue or information required for the other ones. It's really only for the features you're taking advantage of. <coughs> um, at that point in your application, or your runtime, sorry, you just, any allocation or GC calls you want to make, you just need to call the two APIs that were provided. So at that point, you're up and going very quickly, and you can take advantage of some very scalable garbage collection technology. <coughs> um, so I'll go quickly through some of the compiler technology as well. So the heritage for our compiler technology actually comes from embedded Java originally. Uh, but it's actually been used now for our full uh, Java runtime. And a lot of the technology has actually been shared and used by a lot of the IBM static compilers as well. So it shared the back end with XLC and some of the other static compilers. And it was also used for a bunch of binary retranslators as well. Uh, it's a complete clean room implementation. Um, and its design goals were to be a very fast startup, very quick compile times, uh, because it came from the embedded Java originally. And then it has, it's very extensible and flexible in the way that it can actually go uh, and pick and choose what optimization strategies and things it uses to be able to run in very small environments or scale up to very large environments to actually uh, optimize further and provide more performance. Um, like I was saying, it's very configurable optimization framework. It has all of the different types of optimizations you would expect in a compiler. <coughs> There's classic uh, optimizations, loop, data flow, control flow, uh, optimizations happening. It has a very um, well-defined and uh, a great working um, back end for actually doing the code generation. Uh, it provides a code generator for all the platforms we support. Uh, and it does provide the ability to do sort of dynamic recompilation and do some speculative optimizations as well. Uh, so, sorry for the very busy slide here. Uh, so this is sort of the layout and the architecture of the just-in-time compiler th that we have, or the compiler technology. Um, so on the left in the blue, that's sort of representing your runtime itself. Uh, so this would be all the different options and be able to answer questions about your runtime. Um, all methods or bytecodes that are going to be compiled actually will feed down through the IL generator. Uh, once you have the IL, this will go through maybe one or multiple passes through the different uh, optimizer, providing different analysis and optimizations. Um, at all of these different stages, the arrows going back and forth to the right to the left are that these components may be asking the other components different questions to be able to perform their optimizations. So it's trying to track the different um, constraints between the components and how much they need to know about each other. Uh, once, the op once the IL has been optimized, it goes through the code generator and these for the particular platform you're running on. And then this code generator will output your machine code that you can then use to execute your application to get your imp performance improvements. <coughs> so you can use the compiler uh, by actually creating your own native IL generator. So this actually means that in your runtime, you would be responsible for actually converting your bytecodes down into the actual IL itself. So that would be taking whatever instructions were there, opcodes, and saying that it actually represents this exact IL uh, in terms of the uh, OMR compiler in immediate language. This allows you to give the very deepest exploitation of the technology 
Um, then by doing that, you can really get the most throughput and performance out of it. And it gives you the, both, the most ability to actually configure or change or add stuff to it. But learning the actual full set of OMR uh, compiler intermediate language is actually a very deep learning curve. So it actually, would, it actually takes the longest to get a JIT up and running using this way, and then you would actually assume all of the complexity that's associated with that as part of your runtime. Um, as we were going and starting out, it was very quickly realized that a lot of people wouldn't have the time or the expertise to be able to bring up a compiler in this way for some of the smaller runtimes. Uh, so we set out to build more of a easy, generic way to build just-in-time compiler technology for those runtimes. Uh, so this is where our JIT builder technology comes in. So this is a prototype interface that allows you to generate a JIT for your runtime without actually knowing a lot about the deep internals of our compiler technology. It provides a very sort of high-level set of APIs for converting uh, whatever your opcodes are in your, or bytecodes into our intermediate language for you without you actually having to know. So some of the things would be is it has like very simple load store instructions uh, for dealing with uh, memory. Uh, it has all kinds of like conditional operators like if, then, else, and those types of things to be able to actually do your control flow. But you don't actually have to know about the actual details of our IL. Uh, so if you're familiar with uh, some of the LLVM uh, ways of building JIT, it kind of looks uh, you kind of get a similar feel for how this works as well. Uh, there's two very good uh, blog posts that I have the links here for if you want more details about this. <coughs> uh, that goes into lots of examples and things. Um, the, the kind of downside of using this is you would never be able to actually probably get the peak performance out of the JIT because you don't have as much control over how things are being optimized. It sort of sets up an optimization strategy for you and just uses that to go forward. And you can't really build in any, easily build in language optimizations. So your particular runtime may allow you to have, uh, provide you the ability to go off and you know you could do a particular optimization that's only specific to your language. It's kind of more difficult to do it in this way. But this provides you the ability to sort of get a JIT up and going and I would say, uh, not being a JIT guy, the first one I worked on, I had it up and going in about less than a week, uh, showing some pretty significant improvements. <clears throat> one of the other, um, and I feel sort of one of the bigger things that the OMR project brings to a runtime, is some of the RAS technology that we have. Uh, so we have uh, a trace library which is a lightweight mechanism for publishing trace events that can be used for live monitoring or post-mortem debugging. Uh, the trace events can be configured at compile time or run time with different levels to sort of control the impact they have on your application. So you may only want certain trace points enabled in a debug build, or you may want to be able to at run time enable ones that you don't always want enabled to get different information if you're trying to track down something. <clears throat> uh, the trace events are logged to a rolling buffer. Uh, so this way, if you can't, if there's actually a, too much data being generated, you can actually, it just drops that data. So you would lose a bit of data, but you don't actually incur any uh, significant performance imp losses. Um, the next one is DDR. This one actually is probably more useful for a VM implementer themselves. What this does is it actually will scan your code and your uh, shared libraries after your VM is being compiled and generate you out a set of uh, structure definitions so that if you had a system core file later, it could actually go and help you run through and debug that core file because you could dump information about all of your structures because they're known at that point. Uh, so it can help you dig through. Um, and in some cases, we've even written extra tooling on top because you could say walk the, the heap for your runtime. You could actually go and do sort of a check on your heap to verify its validity, find any structural issues and those types of things. Um, 
Verbose GC is another one. So we have a very detailed Verbose GC originally in our Java VM. Um, basically for free by using the GC technology, you get this in your runtime. But what these actually mean is that all of the tooling that was built for the Java VM originally is actually available and can be used out of the box for any runtime consuming uh, this technology. So what that starts to build you is in an environment where you had multiple types of VMs running, if they were sharing this technology, you could use the same tool for performance analysis, uh, debugging, getting extra information across all of the different virtual machines. So quickly, another very busy slide, but this is all the information we provide for a single GC event uh, in Verbose GC. I don't expect anyone to really get anything out of that unless you've used the IBM JVM. You just notice that it's basically the exact same. You couldn't really tell that this comes from a, uh, a, sm a small talk VM that I plugged OMR into and not our Java VM. Um, quickly through some of the tools, there's a memory vi uh, visualizer um, for the different parts of the GC um, stuff. Uh, this works out of the box with our IBM JDK, IBM's Node.js, and all of our prototypes. Uh, the, GC, the garbage collection and memory visualizer tool is an Eclipse plugin. Uh, you can download it from the marketplace. That's a short link if you want to go get it. Uh, and that's a picture of what it looks like. Uh, so this tool would visualize the size of your heaps, uh, your pause times, tell you more information about your runtime throughout the entire run. And as a, also, it will actually provide you with some um, tuning recommendations at times. So if it looks at it and recognizes that you have really long global pauses or you're doing lots of X or Y, it may actually provide you some recommendations that would be useful in running your application the next time. Um, this is the, the full log being displayed uh, from the Smalltalk VM that the last Verbose GC was there for. Another one of the tools that we were very useful in us running and getting information for our Java VM is called Health Center. It's a live uh, monitoring tool that you attach to a running VM. Uh, the goal with this tool is to provide less than a 1% overhead all the time, but by, running this, uh, by using this at runtime, you can actually get some very useful information about what's happening in your system at the time. This is using that uh, trace data that I was talking about earlier. So it actually will provide you uh, information about what's happening in your garbage collector, uh, CPU and native memory from the machine it's running on, uh, different locking information. Uh, so if your VM is using the uh, thread library locks as part of your application, you can actually drill down and get lots of really useful information about what's actually happening in your application under locks. Um, and depending on which components you pick or choose, uh, you would have different sets of things available to view in the tool. Uh, so this is sort of a GC view, but instead of being like the last tool where it was in post-mortem, this one, is, as you're monitoring in your application, would be updating all of the time as the application goes forward and showing you the different details. Um, one of our proof of concepts was plugging our GC into the Ruby MRI VM. Uh, and as soon as we were using the GC, this tool just worked out of the box for us to give us the details. Um, so that's sort of given a bit of an overview now of some of the bigger components, um, some of the tooling that you get by using it. But I'd also like to just quickly talk about some of the different prototypes we've done to show what the benefits are to those runtimes. Um, so the first one that I'll talk about quickly is uh, called Base9. This has actually been implemented by uh, people on my team, and it's more of an educational and teaching VM uh, that we want to use to showcase the different components of the OMR project. Uh, right now, it handles a very small bytecode set, and that's kind of on purpose. Uh, as we go forward, some of the tutorials and examples we're doing, we actually want to be able to have people add some of the other functionality into the interpreter, into the just-in-time compiler, any GC support they have so that they can kind of work through how to build and use the technology. 
Uh, it's a stack-based interpreter that only supports primitive types right now because we've just been working on showing the just-in-time compilation technology. Um, once we integrated the OMR JIT in, uh, some simple things like Fibonacci were more than 100x faster uh, with less than a day's worth of work. Uh, if you go check out the project, you can get it from this GitHub repo. Uh, I'll be making my slides available later so anyone can grab links. It'll be on SlideShare. Uh, there's different kind of flags that you could enable or disable to see the different types of features you can get from the just-in-time compiler technology using JIT Builder. Uh, so you could go with some very basic solutions, which out of the box would show you like two to five or 10x throughput. But then as you use more sophisticated features there, you could get up all the way to the above 100x in these simple uh, benchmarks. Um, Psalm++, which I mentioned before, is really one of the first uh, runtimes we plugged it into. Uh, Psalm is a small talk, uh, via minimal version of small talk that they've used for teaching and researching on virtual machine. Uh, it was done by a bunch of people uh, working at different universities. Uh, they have implementations in a bunch of languages, uh, and since I was going to work with the Omar project, I picked the C++ one. Uh, the first step was to actually plug in our GC technology, and this was my first example, to actually prove that the language agnostic component that I worked on to pull out of our Java VM actually could be used by another runtime. Uh, so I plugged in this, uh, our GC into this runtime, and pretty much uh, right away, there was more than a 2x throughput improvement. Uh, that was to do with the GC times itself and the improved allocation speed that we provide through some of the uh, thread local buffers and stuff that we provide as part of the technology. Uh, next, after we had the JIT Builder te technology around, I uh, started using the JIT Builder technology in here, and this benchmark suite that comes with it was anywhere from three to 30x faster um, very quickly just by using this. Uh, I wanna add our generational technology next uh, to the GC, um, which will actually probably be very simple again. Uh, because this uh, runtime was very well thought out, and it actually has all of the object access barriers that I would need to go forward. Uh, in total, to get uh, all of, I throw up a quick slide here to show the performance. To get all of this performance, I probably spent about three, maybe four weeks of development time to add the GC and the just-in-time compiler. Uh, the one that I want to call out in particular is the loop benchmark. Uh, it's just a very small benchmark, uh, storing to a local variable over and over again. Uh, it's not really a valid benchmark because as soon as I had any level of inlining, it dropped to zero. Uh, it, does a, it just doesn't take any time because there's no work to be done. Uh, so one of the small problems with micro benchmarks. Um, so Lua, we had some of our smaller runtimes but they're not really used anywhere in production. Uh, so Lua, uh, in my opinion, is used in a lot of very interesting places. Um, it's a very small VM, uh, particularly the, the, the POC Rio VM. Um, so we wanted to be able to prove that we could use our just-in-time compiler technology without increasing the footprint too much, but starting to provide some very significant performance improvements. Um, we want it to be comparable or better than Lua JIT, which also exists as another VM. Um, but we also wanted to do uh, more of a proof point with the OMR JIT Builder technology to actually push the performance there and actually drive innovation into our own technology. Uh, as we're only using some of these things with one runtime, it's very easy to get caught up and only going in the direction for that runtime. So the more that we have here, it kind of helps smooth out the edges for our a API boundaries and things. Um, it supports, uh, we ended up added JIT support for the entire uh, bytecode set. Uh, it's less than 50 lines of change to the Lua VM itself to use OMR and be able to compile and execute the JIT functions. But we had to write about 2,000 lines of JIT builder code itself because for every opcode, we had to be able to handle the different parts of it. So all of that was about 2,000 lines of code. <coughs> and on the high end of some of those smaller benchmarks, we're seeing uh, like up to 50x throughput improvement. Um, 
places around calls and those types of things, which are actually very slow in Lua, we're only seeing about a two or three X. Um, one of the things we did realize though, is in a lot of these runtimes that are very dynamic, any variable at any point could become a different type of object. And, and particularly in Lua, could be an int right now, it could be a string on the next line of the code. So we had to be able to, for a lot of the operations, handle the fact that this variable could be any of these types. So basically at that point, the just-in-time compiler sort of died with a death of a million type checks everywhere. It's very hard for the JIT to optimize across that because there are like five paths in a lot of places. Um, so this forced us to actually go and, um, and bring a feature from Java into the uh, Lua VM doing some type specialization. So you can sort of track the types as they're being executed through the interpreter. You assume those types as you JIT the code, put in some guards to make sure that they are the appropriate types on the way into the function, and then you can see some really big improvements. Uh, and again, on um, some of the micro benches, they then drop to basically sort of zero because you know the type, you assume it on the way in. If there are those types, a bunch of math operations can sometimes basically just turn into a single instruction. Um, you can check out uh, the repo there, again, on GitHub. And the next sort of step there is pushing this type specialization as a common feature into JIT Builder so that it would just sort of happen for free in any other runtime that consumed it. Um, quick chart on a few of the performance numbers that we had. Um, and Mandelbrot uh, was probably the biggest one. It went from, uh, it's like, whatever, minutes, 17 minutes, down to uh, under a minute, or just around a minute to run. Uh, and so uh, the last one I want to talk about quickly is OpenJ9. Um, so this is actually the IBM Java virtual machine. Um, since we took all of this technology from the IBM Java VM originally, uh, we actually consume it back on a daily basis. Actually, it's about every hour. So every commit that goes into the open source project is actually consumed back into our development stream on an hourly basis. Um, this really keeps us to actually, uh, forces us to keep everything working. And as we make changes for other runtimes, we actually get to vet them very quickly that they still work with the Java VM. Uh, so it keeps us very honest and makes sure that things will start working across multiple VMs. Uh, since this is where our code came from, the J9 project is basically the, uh, the most sophisticated example of using OMR because it consumes all of the features of all of our components. Um, uh, OpenJ9 will be the name of a new open source project that we're creating where we're actually gonna open source the rest of the JVM technology from IBM. Um, if you wanna know more about that, I won't talk too much about it here, uh, but one of my colleagues, uh, Dan Hadinga, will be speaking in this same room at one o'clock, um, taking a deep dive into the rest of our Java technology that we'll be open sourcing. Um, so really, what's next for our project, uh, at least in, in my opinion? Uh, IBM will continue to be actively developing here because it is actually the core basis of the, the Java VM that all of our technology is built on. Um, and one of the big things we want to do is we really want to work on improving our onboarding experience. There's a lot of complicated technology here, so uh, we really want to work on improving the documentation, doing all of our new design work in the open completely, uh, and having lots more sample code blogs to explain how to consume and use the different pieces. Uh, we want to continue to improve our testing. Uh, currently, right now, we can't test all of the platforms we support in the open, because we don't have all of the types of hardware available. But we're working on getting that, and we're continually adding new uh, support, which we just recently added support for Windows testing. Um, the other big ones are working with, on our, building our community and getting involvement with other different research communities. Uh, we really believe that it's very easy to work and add new features to our components, so we really want to work with some of these different communities to actually get involved and uh, get them working as well. And give them a nice, easy test bed for their uh, research. Um, 
So where to contact us? There's some contact information for myself. Um, there's our dev mailing list, um, which there's a link there to subscribe. Again, our website, the Developer Works open website, and probably the best place to get in touch with anyone working on the project, ask any questions, do anything, is just to go to our GitHub page where the code is. Um, have any questions? Just feel free to open an issue. That's the easiest way to get in, to get everyone's attention, and we'll uh, get on that and handle it very quickly. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah, actually, two uh, fast questions. Uh, First one, in what language or languages uh, can you provide uh, glue code? Uh, most of it can be provided in C or C++. Uh, but of course, if you're working those languages, you could do assembly as well. But uh, most all of our APIs are, uh, most of our code is developed in C++ now. There's a bunch of legacy C code. And in anywhere where we have C++ code, there's usually a C API as well, or the ability to provide data through the glue in C. And second one is, uh, under what license are you releasing the toolkit? Uh, the toolkit is under uh, dual license Apache uh, 2.0 and Eclipse 1.0. Uh, uh, yeah. So as open as it can be at this point. Okay, uh, if there's no more questions, I'd like to thank everybody for coming out this morning. Uh, it was a 9 a.m. Uh, uh, talk, so I appreciate everyone getting up early and coming out and listening to me, uh, and thank you guys.